Hi, I'm Dr. Wendla. Welcome to my channel. And today we're talking about insomnia. You, has this ever happened to you? It's happened to most people. So the question is, what technically is insomnia? When does it become, when does it go from being, I had a bad night's sleep to it's medically insomnia and I need to do something about it. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Technically, insomnia is one of the sleep-wake disorders. There are 10 diagnosable sleep-wake disorders. I'm not going to go through all 10 of them today. They include things like hypersomnolence, narcolepsy, which some people have heard of, nightmares, restless leg syndrome, and a few very interesting but really rare disorders, which I'll talk about in other videos. But back to insomnia. Technically, insomnia is defined as a predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality, so it can be either one, that is associated with one or more of the following. Don't get overwhelmed with this slide. I put all of this in here because it's in the DSM, so it's nice for completeness, but don't, don't, don't read it. The bottom line is people with insomnia have either trouble falling asleep, so tossing and turning, I can't get to sleep within a reasonable period of time, or trouble staying asleep, so waking up a lot during the night with difficulty getting back to sleep once you wake up, or waking up really early in the morning. A lot of times people will complain that they wake up at, say, 3.02 a.m., every night. And it's interesting because I often hear that people will wake up at the same time every night, 302 or 432 repeatedly. And these things have to occur in spite of having adequate opportunity for sleep. So obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but this has to happen even if you have had plenty of chances for sleep. So sometimes people are too busy. They're students or they have to work 90 hours a week or they have small children or or whatever so they really don't have the opportunity to get in the bed and actually sleep so in that case it's really not insomnia the problem can't be entirely due to another sleep problem so for example having sleep apnea which is preventing you from getting an adequate quality of sleep in addition the problem cannot be due entirely to another condition for example, you have a medical condition which is causing a lot of pain, and the pain is then decreasing the quality of sleep or quantity of sleep, waking you up throughout the night. You can have another condition in addition to insomnia. So lots of people have both um, uh, pain disorder and insomnia, but the insomnia can't be entirely caused by the uh, the first condition, the pain disorder or depression or anxiety or whatever. We'll get back to that in a minute. Insomnia can be broken up into two types. There's both acute, which is less than one month in duration, and there's chronic, which is greater than a month in duration. So like I said a minute ago, the diagnosis of the insomnia can be given even if another uh, diagnosis is present. And this is very important because you can have a pain disorder, you can have anxiety, you can have depression, you can have lots of things that disrupt your sleep. And just because you have those does not mean you do not also have insomnia. And I'm mostly saying this because I have a lot of medical students and uh, physicians who are non-psychiatrists and other treatment providers who watch these videos, and I, I, I want to make that clarification for them. If you're, if you're not a, a medical personnel or, or a treatment provider, it doesn't really matter. The, if you're having trouble sleeping, that's, that's all that, that really matters. And if you're having trouble sleeping that's significant and chronic, then ignore all that. that I so the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems associated with chronic insomnia is the resulting daytime fatigue that that happens and that causes a tremendous amount of other consequences stress fatigue mood problems and an increased level of anxiety for lots of people studies on chronic sleep deprivation show that 
It can result in increased irritability, as I said, mood swings, mood disturbance, depression, and then, of course, the resulting personal and professional problems, problems at work, problems with school, concentration, chronic fatigue, and significant impairments in focus and the performance of complex manual skills. Additional risks include falling asleep while driving, headaches, specifically tension headaches, gastrointestinal problems, and then the potential for overuse of medications, stimulants to stay awake, depressants of various sorts to get to sleep. The development and course of insomnia is, is a little bit complicated. For most people, Insomnia, and when, again, when I say insomnia, I'm talking about the medical diagnosis of insomnia. So medical insomnia typically shows up in early adulthood first. There are a couple of exceptions to this. For women with the hormonal changes of menopause, sometimes we do see first onset insomnia at that point. Insomnia can occur in children and teenagers. As I said earlier, it can be acute or it can become chronic. The type of insomnia seems to vary depending upon age. With younger people, it's usually early insomnia, meaning trouble falling asleep. With people in middle age and later adulthood, elderly people, it becomes more often early morning awakening and having trouble getting back to sleep. There are lots of different causes for insomnia. Stress is a big one, particularly in young adulthood. Substance use, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Medical problems, a lot of different types of medical problems are associated. And psychiatric diagnoses. Sometimes no cause is found at all, and there's a lot of study going on in that area. As far as substances go, this is usually brought on because people use substances in order to treat the insomnia. So people use depressants such as benzodiazepines, Valium, Ativan, over-the-counters like Benadryl, melatonin, and illegal substances like THC, well, it's legal in some places, um, to treat the insomnia. Also alcohol, all of those things can lead to tolerance and actually ultimately disrupt the sleep architecture. Similarly, there can be overuse of stimulants like caffeine and misuse of stimulants like Adderall and methylphenidate or heavily dosed caffeine drinks to try and stay awake and combat the fatigue that results from insomnia. All of this stuff disrupts the sleep architecture further and unfortunately makes insomnia worse. Stress issues can include stress from work, particularly overwork, family and relationship issues, personal responsibilities, having a new baby in the house. Um, shift work can be very damaging to the circadian rhythm, which is the rhythm that we sleep and wake by. So there is research to show that people who have nighttime work, even if they work uh, overnight shifts only sometimes have very disrupted sleep schedules and have trouble getting adequate sleep. A lot of research has been done looking at diagnostic markers and sleep and insomnia. Genetics probably play a part. There are a lot of studies looking at twins and it sh and we can see that there are some people who have a genetic or biological vulnerability to be more sensitive to environmental factors. They probably have some sensitivity to cortisol levels, cortisol being a wake-up hormone. There seems to be a higher prevalence of insomnia in some women, particularly with advancing age. Poor sleep hygiene, and we will get to that in a minute, also contributes to insomnia. So let's talk about what you can do. Let's talk a little bit about what's called sleep hygiene. First of all, cool, dark room, very important. To the best of your ability, you want to be sleeping in a cool, dark room. Sometimes that means putting on eye shades. You want to have a cool, and you want the room to be 
quiet, so you may need to use earplugs. If you have a partner who snores in particular, definitely want to use some of those. You want to establish a sleep-wake cycle that is as consistent as possible. Generally, that means getting up at the same time every day, even on the weekends, or as close as possible to the same time every day. Everyone always groans when I say this, but it is the most powerful control that you have. <clears throat> People often focus at getting to bed at a certain time, and then they toss and turn and toss and turn. Really, you want to put your focus on getting a wet up at the same time. You have a lot more control over that. And the, the goal should be not to have to use an alarm. So if you have to get up at 530 and your alarm is jarring you out of bed, that means you didn't go to bed. You didn't go to sleep early enough. So you want to be backing up your sleep so that you, when you wake up at whatever time you have to get up, it's not so incredibly painful. You don't want to smoke. You don't want to use caffeine anywhere in your bed. You don't want to smoke at all. Just saying. But you definitely don't want to smoke or use caffeine anywhere in your bedtime. Those stimulants will knock the heck out of your, uh, out of your sleep. And you want to reduce your alcohol intake to zero if possible. But certainly you want to reduce it as much as possible. Alcohol is a depressant when you drink, when you have it initially, and later on those metabolites are stimulants and they wake you up, so not near bedtime. You want to exercise daily if possible, at least a little bit, even a walk, and but you want to do that way early in the day, not close to bedtime, because it will stimulate you and make it difficult to get to sleep. You want to use the bed only for sleeping. Sleeping and sex, but definitely not for texting, working, making phone calls, all of those things that stimulate your brain and keep you awake. And there's a psychological reason for this, which is that you are teaching your brain that bed is not for being awake and doing wake wake up activities. OK, it is for relaxing and for sleeping. Um if you cannot sleep, if you are in bed and you cannot sleep, and it doesn't matter if it is 9 o'clock or if it is 3 o'clock in the morning, get out of the bed. Get out of the bed, sit in a chair, do something really boring. Read a boring book, um, do your taxes, do something that is boring. Don't turn on the television. Don't turn on the internet. Don't do YouTube. Don't do Twitter. Don't do those things that can keep you going for a long period of time. Most people, that's their go-to. If I can't sleep, I'm going to go you know, mess around on the internet. Don't do that. It will keep you awake. Practice this habit for a period of time. And not a lot, 30 days for sure. But if you practice this habit for three days, it will get easier. I promise. So what are the professional... Uh, treatments for insomnia, particularly when it becomes really chronic. Part of that depends upon what the cause is, obviously. If there are underlying causes or underlying exacerbations like depression, anxiety, medical problems, sleep apnea, pain disorders, all of those things need to be treated. And those things, treating those things will absolutely positively impact your sleep. I often see people who have chronic depression, and by treating the depression, we improve that sleep architecture and sleep quality gets better right away. Often I see people who don't even know that their sleep quality is really bad. We fix the depression and the sleep quality improves and the daytime fatigue gets better right away. So that's that has to be said. In addition to that, therapy, cognitive therapy, therapy behavioral therapy, supportive therapy, all, all play a role. Medications can play a role, although it should be brief and should be very carefully managed. There are sleep medications. Usually we use specific sleep medications in very specific circumstances and usually for a short period of time. Medicines like melatonin over the counter can be used and can be used very safely, but should be recommended by your doctor. There are prescription medications, prescription sleep medications. Also, they can be used and very safely, but should be managed by your doctor. In addition, all of these things should always be managed in combination with the sleep hygiene treatments that I mentioned in the previous few slides. Okay, so let's summarize. What have we learned? 
insomnia, the medical definition is that it is one of the sleep-wake disorders in the DSM-5-TR, which, by the way, is the new DSM that is out just very, very recently. And I'll be talking more about that in another video. And insomnia is defined as a predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality that can manifest either as, and this is important, problems falling asleep, staying asleep, or with early morning awakening, present for at least three nights a week for at least three months. It can be treated and it does not require a medical professional unless you're at home treatments, which mostly consist of good sleep hygiene and eliminating a lot of substances. Unless your at home treatments do not work or it becomes very chronic or very severe. See my video here on signs of psychiatric problems you don't want to miss, illnesses. So that's it for now. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.